Welcome to the Atlantico podcast, where we talk about the science behind the Atlantico project, the Atlantic Ocean, and the human adventures experienced along the way. Here, we have conversations with guests from around the world who work together so that we can better understand, manage, and protect the ocean. So let's embark on the journey of Atlantico and discover the world that lies above and beneath the surface of the beautiful Atlantic Ocean. Welcome back to the Atlantico podcast and we are back with an episode dedicated to discovering a region of the Atlantic with one of the Atlantico scientists who embarked on the Tara schooner during the mission microbiomes of the Tara Ocean Foundation and one of Atlantico's flagship expeditions. Our guest today is Samuel Chaffron and he was chief scientist on Tara to study the upwelling in Senegal and Gambia. And he will tell us about the scientific questions that the team were trying to answer. But first, let's get to know our guest. Sam, hi and welcome. It is a pleasure to have this chat with you today. Hi, Louise. Uh, well, it's uh, reciprocal. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today as well. Yeah, and uh, so as I mentioned, we'll, uh, we'd like to get to know you a little bit. So can you share with us how your connection with the ocean started, how it evolved, and also tell us about the journey that has led you to where you are today? Well, actually, I have relatively close connection to the ocean because I grew up about uh, 100 meters from the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, actually, in Brittany, in Loch Tudy. So I grew up next to the ocean. My father, my grandfather were fishermen. So I was really close to the ocean and um, the ocean has been feeding me for all these years, actually, until I uh, I moved out and, uh, and went on to studies at universities, so mainly in France. A key moment, I think, during these studies has been um, a scientific internship. The, the first one I did, it was in Roscoff, in fact, at the marine station in Roscoff and where I worked on Pico cyanobacteria, that's where it all started actually, where I started to discover and realize the, the power of, uh, of plankton basically, and especially <laughs> phytoplankton, and, and, and these small uh, cyanobacteria, in particular Prochlorococcus and uh, Cinecococcus. And also there actually, uh, I was involved in, in fact in uh, building a system to, to do light and uh, dark cycle to, to culture this cyanobacteria. And that's where also I started to have first contact with computer science because we had to, to control by computer the system. And probably this was also influential in well, guiding my, my, my research or my, my path to, towards also bioinformatics, computer science, because I'm, uh, I'm also a bioinformatician. And then I, I moved, uh, I did a PhD in, uh, in Zurich, in Switzerland, computational biology, systems biology. So trying to understand by uh, modeling microbial ecosystems. And then I moved to Brussels in a bioinformatics lab. I, I started to work with Tara back in 2011. And, and also this brought me back to meet again people from Roscoff who were involved in Tara. So yeah, that was, uh, it was very pleasant to, to be able to, to work with these people again. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of stories from people to say you know, it started by because the ocean was right there in front of me. Um, so today we're discussing the leg of mission microbiomes, which was focusing on the Senegalese upwelling. So can you explain what the particularities of that region are and what sort of scientific questions you were trying to answer whilst you were there? The lake started in Gambia, from Banjul in Gambia, from the capital of Gambia, to Dakar in Senegal. And we sampled this area in front of the coast of Senegal, which is a, a very productive area. So um, these waters are very uh, rich, in fact. We call this region uh, an upwelling region because we have, in winter, enrichment by nutrients that comes from uh, cold water, uh, deep cold water, that come to the surface. So here the interest was to uh, to better understand this upwelling region and also in particular the state of this region before the upwelling season. Because the upwelling takes place in winter usually when you have strong wind chasing the, the hot uh, water in surface. So then this cold water filled with nutrients can come up. 
and help to create these uh, blooms of plankton, which supports uh, large stocks of, uh, of fish, actually. This area is a, a world-famous uh, area for fisheries. Uh, it's, a, it's a very productive area. So the idea was to better characterize the, the pre upwelling state of this region, because we went there in August, so in summer, so that's not the actual upwelling season, but so we went to, to sample specific stations that have been sampled uh, regularly by uh, the IRD crews, who's working there every year. So the idea was to, to sample and to try to characterize the pre-upwelling state, because the, these crews, IRD crews, will actually sample at the same station as us in December. And they will also integrate all the, the Tara uh, omics protocol. So we will be able to compare this pre-upwelling um, state of the system of, of the coast of Senegal with uh, the, the actual upwelling uh, state. So that was the first objective, characterizing the, the, the upwelling uh, system there of the coast of Senegal. Another uh, objective was to characterize the um, oxygen minimum zone that we can encounter there of the coast of Senegal. So this oxygen minimum zone can be found in several regions of the ocean, especially in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean also of the coast of uh, South America and the U.S., uh, north of the U.S., so these zones are um, where we encounter a minimum of oxygen, and uh, this is caused by several factors, uh, which are both abiotic and biotic, so physical processes, but also biological processes. So we, we still don't fully understand how they form, but we know that they are expanding and that they are uh, modifying the, the composition of the plankton. They, they also may have a strong impact modifying the plankton communities on the, the fisheries, in fact, that are there in, in this productive area. This second objective was to try to characterize this oxygen minimum zone, which we could sample. We detected it at around 100 meters depth, so we could sample uh, we could sample it as well. So that was a successful leg in a way because we could uh, sample it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you set out to do both things and you managed to sample both environments. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to to see what results come out of there and uh, and nice to see that there's also collaboration with ongoing you know expeditions that already exist and sharing the data between different projects different initiatives so that we can all together work to better understand what is out there and how it functions and how it influences the ecosystem and all the services that these uh, ecosystems provide so now that we know what you wanted to study, can you tell us how this was um, studied? So what did you have to do? What will happen next? And also how will this help to improve our knowledge on how the ocean is doing and how it might evolve over time? Since this leg was in fact also collaboration with this IRD, so the Institute for the Research and Development, I don't know how to, to translate it, but we targeted five stations of the coast of Senegal that they are regularly sampling. So we went to uh, sample two surface stations, so quite close to the um, coast, about a few tens of miles of the coast. We sample only surface. Well, usual protocols were applied. So we used the plankton net uh, and the pump to sample all the size fractions of the plankton. So from viruses to bacteria, archaea, protists, and uh, metazoan. So two, two stations close to the coast where we, we observed high productivity, a lot of diatoms, although it was uh, the pre-upwelling season, but they was already very productive in a way. So that was interesting. And then we also sampled three other stations further off the coast, so about 40 mi nautic miles off the coast. And there we could sample, do a fine scale sampling of surface also the, and also the DCM, the deep chlorophyll maximum, where we encounter a maximum of chlorophyll, as well as this oxygen minimum zone that was around 90, 100 meters. So it was interesting because we could detect uh, a relatively well-defined uh, deep chlorophyll maximum around 50 meters. So there was quite a lot of plankton there as well, but we can imagine that when the, the IRD crews will sample, they will actually uh, encounter uh, at the same spots, well, much more biomass, I suppose. 
And it would be interesting also to see how this OMZ, the oxygen minimum zone, is impacted by this upwelling system. And do we actually also detect an increase of biomass in this oxygen minimum zone, you know, as it will, it should be the case for a surface DCM. We expect to see much more biomass and, uh, and large blooms, likely uh, of uh, diatoms. So it will be interesting to see how, yeah, how this OMZ will be responding also to this uh, upwelling, to this enrichment. Yeah, because I mean, I guess if, if there's no oxygen, then there, it's more difficult for life to to prosper and to grow. So you, it's kind of a contrasting, you know, you've got an upwelling where biomass is developing, you expect to find more plankton there, but at the same time, these zones, there's no oxygen. So how could they grow? So I guess that's the, the one of the questions. Yeah, that's one of the main questions, exactly. So so there is still, of, uh, there is still some oxygen. Right? It's not completely uh, depleted in oxygen, uh, although, of course, some, some plankton won't be able to grow because there is not enough oxygen, uh, especially for all of them. So there, there should be uh, less biomass. There will be also different species, in fact, developing there, especially planktonic species that are um, adapted to low, low oxygen concentration. We know that some bacteria can thrive in these low oxygen concentration zones. So that's why these, these samples would be very interesting to also to be compared between, uh, well, the pre-upwelling states and the, the upwelling state. Yeah, a lot of uh, new insight, I think, will come out of these samples. Uh, and so for our leg, the samples are already well, well shipped to Genoscope, but we will have to wait for the, the samples of the IRD crews also to be able to compare, right? So this will still take some time, of course, but that's going to be very interesting to be able to compare these two seasons. Yeah, because, I mean, one thing is to take the sample, the other is to analyze. I mean, there's genomic studies, so you need to wait for all the sequencing to be done. There's imaging studies, and then you get all this kind of data, and then somebody has to look at all this data and make sense of it all. Um, so, yeah, we're still a, a way off of having some form of uh, of understanding of what's going on. And uh, maybe we'll come back to you to see what you found out, uh, maybe in a, in a couple of years' time. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, it will take some time. It's true that uh, we need some time to sequence, image all these samples. And then uh, what takes even longer is actually uh, to integrate all this uh, heterogeneous data we have. And uh, yeah, to interpret what we observe, what we uh, to to mine all this data. So that that's I think that's what what takes uh, even the longest time, basically. Yeah. So we have some work ahead. And we'll come back to it uh, maybe. Yeah, as I said, a couple of years time. Hopefully, we'll we'll have made good progress there. Turning now to a slightly different subject, but something that we cover in each episode. So with each guest of the of the expedition that uh, we've heard that each scientific study was dedicated to a woman who contributed to the field of marine sciences or to the field of marine sports, for example. And in this case, it is actually a little bit different as uh, we want to have a more general statement on this subject. So can you tell us a little bit about the idea? Well, yeah, I think it's important to recognize and acknowledge all the work by, well, by actually all the women that have been involved in the, in, in building, uh, making this expedition and this project possible. So uh, I think it's a good idea to acknowledge and, um, and, and say thank you to all the women that has been involved, that have been involved, including you, Eloise, <laughs> in this project. Um, and all the women, uh, well, on land, but also at sea. I think uh, I'm thinking about all the women from the, the Tara Foundation also. There are a number who, who make this uh, expedition possible. It's maybe hard to imagine, but it's a lot of work uh, to organize all the logistics uh, of this type of expedition, all the communication also, and the outreach. Uh, there are many women involved. And for the science, there are also many women involved, actually. It's good to, to make maybe a general acknowledgement about all the work for, from these women. And I'm also thinking about the women at sea who sailed, who have been sailing on Tara and also the other boats uh, that were involved during the missions. So as to all the women that made that expedition possible and then that will in the future also help with the data we mentioned, the amounts of data that has been collected and that will uh, will allow the, the field to grow and to improve. So 
Yeah, of course, there are women in the labs also helping us to, to make sense of all this data. In our lab, actually, we have PhD students working with this type of data. So at all levels, we have uh, women, right, making this possible. So let's and we need them. them all. And we need <laughs> them, of course. <laughs> we need each other to make, a, you know, to make everything go forward. Okay, well, let's have our conversation go back to your experience on Tara and to, to finish on that note, actually. Can you tell us what it was like for you? I mean, you mentioned that you've been working with Tara for a while now, but uh, let's focus on this specific experience there. And uh, can you tell us about your life on board, the memories you've brought back from that region and, and the, of course, the people, as we said, people are important. So the people that you shared that journey with. Yeah, sure. Well, actually, that was my uh, my my third time on uh, on a uh, leg on board Tara, and it's always incredible memories you bring back from this experience. Uh, always memorable, really. I mean, the first time was back in 2013 in Atlantic as well, at the beginning of the uh, Polar Circle expedition from Brittany to Norway. So that was a fantastic experience. And more recently, I embarked twice uh, during the Atlantic Commission. What was very special about this uh, last leg is the fact that I embarked again with two Brazilian uh, Brazilian scientists, uh, Erika and Pedro. It was very, very nice to be able to embark with them again. And because we, we had been a great team, actually, working together. And it was also really nice to be able to, to meet again some of the sailors on board. It takes few days, but then there is always a, like a synergy, symbiosis <laughs> forming on the boat usually because we need to work hard, right, to make it uh, successful. So, yeah, I, li I like this that somehow it, we, we self-organize oursel uh, ourselves on board and uh, usually it goes always very well. And uh, there are strong bonds, strong connections all always forming on uh, during one leg. We also had the chance to observe a lot of uh, sea life, you know, a lot of dolphins, even a turtle. So that was uh, quite nice memories. And, and one night we even saw a large crews of dolphins, you know. This shows actually to, to what extent this, this, uh, this region is very uh, productive and rich. You see a lot of life, much more than what we have been observing in, off the coast of Brazil, actually, during the lake around the sea months. Where there, the region was very oligotrophic, so we didn't observe almost almost no life ex except some plankton, of course, no mammals basically. And during this leg, we we saw a lot of dolphins, and uh, and we even saw dolphins playing around the boat in uh, bioluminescent plankton. So that was uh, a very nice memory, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and we compared that with uh, all the scientists on board and some of the sailors, so it was a, a very good moment. Yeah. Yeah, those memories uh, are the kind that will last for a lifetime, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. So, Sam, I have to thank you for uh, taking the time to speak to us today and to explain, you know, what you were doing uh, while studying the ocean off the coast of, um, of Senegal and Gambia. Uh, it's been really interesting and I, you know, I'm sure we'll be back to hear from the results, if not you know, all of them, maybe initial thoughts and initial results from uh, from this expedition and what has been found out. But uh, for now, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, let's keep the work going. Well, thanks to you, Eloise. And uh, it was a pleasure to exchange with you too. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and look forward to seeing you next time. You can follow the Atlantico project on our website on www.atlantico.eu and you can also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. All the links and information on the project and on today's episode is in the show notes. Atlantico is a project funded under Horizon 2020, a European Union research and innovation programme.